What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Leah Matthews. How you doing, Leah? Hey, Chief. Doing great. How about um, you? I'm doing wonderful. It's a great day for a Chief Chat, right? It is. Yes, sir. Last one uh, before Thanksgiving. Yes, yes, absolutely. Man, this is this is monumental right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we, we got a special co-host today. Um, he is the commander for the exchange in Europe, Southwest Asia region, Colonel Scott McFarlane. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Chief. Thanks for having me and uh, happy Thanksgiving early to everybody. Absolutely. And, and where, are you, where are you dialing in from, sir? I am calling in from Germany, uh, from lovely Kaiserslautern, Germany, where, uh, you know, it's, it's a little colder here uh, than some of the places in the States, but uh, it, it's a beautiful place to live. Yeah, it, it sounds like a rough life you're living out there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, everybody, much, much, much like in the States, Chief, everybody here is turned down and uh, uh, staying healthy as best they can. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us today, sir. Uh, and, and we have been blessed to hear uh, so many amazing stories uh, about true American heroes. And today we get to hear from two of them. So we got we got a we got a double dose of just wonderfulness. So Leah, uh, can you please introduce today's guest? Chief, yes, absolutely. Thanks so much. And welcome, Colonel McFarland. It's always great to see you. Um, guys, this is our final Chief Chat episode in our special In Recognition of series. All month long, the exchange has been honored to salute our nation's heroes like today's guests, our friends at the Navy Exchange, Marine Corps Exchange, Coast Guard Exchange, and Defense Commissary Agency helped us host this special series honoring veterans and their valor. Want to extend a big thank you to them and all of our special guests who shared their stories of courage. Today, we have two outstanding guests with us. Both of them received the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest military honor for actions taken in April 1970 in Khan province during the Vietnam War while serving in the Army. So they are here today to share their story of valor and selfless sacrifice. Please help us welcome Sergeant Major Retired Gary Luttrell and Sergeant Gary Bykirk. Yay. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for joining us and for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions for these heroes, we'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now is a great time to start your watch party to enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following us, well, why not? Chief chats are every week. Plus we have a lot of great other content. So that will help you know what's coming up at your exchange. Absolutely. And uh, so Sergeant Major Latrell and Sergeant Bykirk, uh, we are so honored to have you with us today. Uh, all of us at the military exchanges and the commissary appreciate your service and your dedication to our great nation. Uh, thank you so much for making some time to, to talk with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. And echoing uh, Chief Osby's sentiment, thank you both for being with us today. Where are you joining us from and uh, how have you been faring during this pandemic? Uh, I'm coming uh, from St. Petersburg, uh, St. Pete Beach, uh, Florida. I live on a little barrier island off of uh, St. Petersburg. And I'm coming in from uh, western New York, a uh, small little town, Greece, outside of Rochester, uh, pretty close to the shores of Lake Ontario. So we, uh, we're getting into the time where we don't get much sun, so we, we're looking for, forward to any kind of sun that we can get. <laughs> they're, they're both beautiful places that I've had the pleasure of visiting. You look at a little bit of sun, a little bit of uh, snow and uh, water in both places. And uh, like I said, I've been both places and they're both gorgeous. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah. yeah. So one, one sounds like pants weather and the other one sounds like short, shorts weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> Sergeant Major Luttrell, we'd like to start with you. What led you to join the Army? Can you share that with our audience? I was uh, nine years old. My uncle took me down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and took me out on the drop zone there at the 101st Airborne. And I watched the C-130s fly by and little dots coming out the back. And I turned to my uncle and I said, what is that? 
He said, that's paratroopers. Those are, those are soldiers. I had no idea people jumped out of airplanes. <laughs> and I, I, I remember just looking up in awe and saying, oh, my God, I've got to do that. So I talked about my birth certificate. Um, when I was 15, got joined the Army, got halfway through basic training before I got caught. Um, I got caught and sent <laughs> back home. And on my legal 17th birthday, um, I joined the Army with a contract to go airborne. And so that trip that my uncle took me to Fort Campbell is what inspired me to, uh, to be in the military wow. in the best 22 years of my life. Wow. wow! Wow! So, so back on this this getting caught thing. That that's <laughs> so. <laughs> so how, how far how far along do basic training did you get before you got caught? Well, I, we were in the uh, marksmanship phase. It was about halfway. Uh, I was about halfway through, and it was so funny. Uh, you know, being from Kentucky, uh, I, I I was shooting at uh, the age of two and three, and pretty wow. good marksman. And I have to say, and of course, I didn't have any competition. I had them city slickers from Los Angeles, California. <laughs> now those city slickers probably can shoot pretty good, but back then they couldn't. <clears throat> got on the rifle range, and uh, I could hear these sergeants say, boy, that kid Latrell can shoot. And when the day was over, we got back into formation. He says, okay, uh, you know, here's uh, who's fired, expert, uh, marksman, and uh, sharpshooter, and our top Shooter today was Private Latrell. Well, I was so proud. We got back. Uh, we got back to the company, and the first sergeant walked out on the back step and gave all of his instructions and said, "And I want to see Private Latrell in the orderly room." I said, "Oh my God, I get to go see God in the orderly room." <laughs> I mean, the first sergeant, and uh, get me a pat on the back for being a good marksman. And I walked in, and he looked at me, and he said, "Latrell, how old are you?" I knew I was busted. <laughs> I knew I was, busted. and I said, "I'm 15, first sergeant, but I'm a good soldier. I can stay, right?" He said, "No." So he gave me a bus ticket and a ten dollar bill, and uh, and said, "Come on back in two years." And sure enough, two years later, I was back. But I, it broke my heart. I, uh, I, uh, I come from a very Aww. dysfunctional family, and to be in the army uh, uh, when I legally joined and stayed, you know, I met my family. Uh, I started my own family, my wife, my two two boys, and all of my brothers, and then finally, in the later years, all of my brothers and sisters that I served with on active duty was my family, and it was a functional family, far from the dysfunctional family that I'm born here. Oh, man, that's, that's an amazing story. Amazing yeah. story. Uh, and, and, and Sergeant Mike Kurt, what about you? Can you uh, tell us about your story and why you joined the Army? Well, I, I also kind of came from a dysfunctional family. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was young, and I, I went to 11 different high schools before I hit ninth grade. Um, when I got into high school, probably about the only thing that I was sure of for my future was that the girl I was going with at the time, she and I were going to spend the rest of our lives together. Graduation came. Uh, she went to college, so I went to college with her. Uh, she majored in phys ed, so I majored in phys ed, too, because my future was her. Uh, we were there for like two months and she broke up with me. <laughs> and so I, uh, being there um, and not really having any other reason to be there, uh, I kind of took a downhill turn. Um, I started to, uh, started to party pretty hard. And then I, I decided that maybe, maybe what I needed to do was to go into military. A good friend of mine, his girlfriend broke up with him and we were at a bar once and he said, so what are we gonna do? And I said, I don't know, what are you gonna do? And he said, I'm gonna go into the Marine Corps. Come on, we'll go into the buddy. And I said, uh, I'm not going into the Marines. Those guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go into Green Berets, Dad. Come on into Green, Green Berets with me. And he said, no way. Um, so I got thinking about, I had been reading a book, Robin Moore, uh, about the Green Berets. And uh, it really sounded like a challenge. And I always loved challenges. I remember talking to uh, one of my advisors when I told him I was thinking about going in the military and he was prior service. And I said, what do you think? And he said, well, I'll tell you, the military will either kill you or make you a better person. And that was a, that was a test. That was a challenge that was laid down before me. And uh, 
So I went in and the military provided all kinds of tests for me, all kinds of challenges. And um, life is gonna challenge every, every decision that you make, the reasons that you choose to do something, you're gonna get tested on that. And uh, my decision to go in because I wanted to make my girlfriend jealous, that didn't hold up too long, not too many <laughs> tests. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, the first time I got shot, I wasn't even thinking about my girlfriend anymore. But uh, I, I didn't, I, I guess maybe because of my upbringing, I didn't wanna quit. So I was able to go on through the military, I'll face all the challenges. Um, and the, the biggest thing that enabled me to be successful was the fact that I, I just didn't want to quit. There was just no way that I was going to say, uh, I'm done. Um, and that kind, of, uh, that kind of attitude was instilled in me partly because of the military, but also be, partly because of the way that I was brought up. Uh, but like Gary, um, the military provided me uh, a family. It provided me a, a place where I had a sense of belonging. It provided me a place where I felt that um, that I was needed, that there was something unique and that I was worthwhile. And, and the military provided that for me and, it's, and it stayed with me. Wow, you know, it's amazing because both your stories uh, show just how humble you were at the start uh, and continuing right down to, right along to today. Uh, drive for success and the humbleness that have defined you, whether or not the, the military was a part of that or whether it was part upbringing or both, it, it's just an amazing story. So uh, appreciate those backgrounds. Uh, each of you served in Vietnam. Uh, your acts of valor occurred within days of each other. Uh, Sergeant Bikirk, we're gonna turn to you first. Uh, you served as a special forces combat medic when your camp in Kantum province came under enemy attack. Take us back to April 1st, 1970. And what can you share with us about that day? Well, in order to provide some context to what took place on April 1st, you have to, I have to give some background. Uh, um, when I was growing up, we, we always used to play army and we would play like we were in, we were in Europe or anywhere. But when we were playing army, I said, I don't want to go to the South Pacific because I don't like jungles and I don't like snakes and I don't like tigers. So when I found out I was going to be going to Vietnam and I was going to be living with a group of people in the jungles called the mountain yards, my worst fears were realized. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to be living in with this group of people, primitive people, and I'm going to be with tigers and, and snakes. Um, one of the first things that I was introduced to was the mountain yard culture. They were a tremendous, tremendous uh, people. Um, they were, uh, in many cases, referred to as primitive. But when I got there, uh, one of the things that I did was I befriended a 15-year-old mountain yard boy. Uh, in, the, in the mountain yard culture, I was surprised to see 12-year-old kids walking around with weapons. But in the mountain yard culture, when this individual became 12 years old, they became a responsible member of that tribe, they were needed. And so each person had their duty. They knew what they were supposed to be doing. And so I picked this 15 year old mountain air boy and I said, look, Dale, you gotta, you gotta help me learn how to survive in the jungle. Um, Cause I'm afraid of snakes and I don't wanna meet up with any tigers. And he laughed and he said, I don't wanna teach you how to survive. He said, I wanna teach you how to live. He said, because we live in the jungle. The jungle gives us our way of life. So I wanna teach you how to live. So for the next year that I was with him, this mountain yard tribe that was a totally different culture, ethnic minority group, but in the midst of this jungle, in the midst of this war, this tribe taught me how to live and how to love. Uh, they, they were the people that gave me a sense of belonging. They were the people that I, I felt that I was with them. I, was, I had a special purpose of being with them. And Dale was very instrumental in doing this. Um, our camp was attacked April 1st. Uh, early in the morning, we started taking in incoming uh, artillery and everything. Um, early in the morning, the only people that were usually up were women and children. So most of the people that were um, casualties at times were women and children, which was really uh, uh, something that I still can't get out of my, my mind, uh, seeing, seeing the young women and children that were just uh, devastated by the, the artillery. But in the midst of that, within the first hour or so, I was shot in the back, I couldn't move. 
And in the midst of this battle, I felt somebody picking me up and it was Deo, my 15 year old bodyguard. And I, I said, uh, Deo, how'd you find me? And he said, this is where I belong. I belong with you. And that was the camaraderie that we had for one another, the love that we had for one another. So Deo carried me. I was shot two more times uh, as we continued to, to fight and to bring people down that were wounded, taking them down in a medical bunker. Uh, I got shot the third time and I thought I was gonna die. And I told Deo, if I'm dying, we're, I'm not dying down here. Get me back out in the battle. So Deo carried me back out into the battle and we continued to fight. Deo got shot and he couldn't carry me anymore. But he, what we did was we dragged each other through the battle to continue fighting, to be there with one another, support each other. Now here this 15 year old kid is, is loving me like that. A kid who taught me how to live, how to love. He, we heard a rocket coming in and Dale rolled me over, laid on top of me and he was killed by the rocket blast. Um, a couple more yards picked me up and they carried me around until eventually I collapsed. And, and then I was medevaced, I think maybe the first or the second day. Um, but those are uh, the most vivid memories that I have of that battle um, all include Dale, that 15 year old mountain yard boy. For without him, I could not have done anything that I had, uh, that I did. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Dale. Man, God, God bless Dale, and it's 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 just, man, it, it's it's amazing to hear that you 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 learned so many life lessons from a 15 year old, uh, and, and it's even you say uh, he taught me how to live. Like that's that can be implied applied in so many facets of our life. Uh, as we know it right now. So that's, that's just uh, amazing that, uh, and, and even before you went over there, I'm sure you had your kind of preconceived notions of, of what you thought that area was gonna be and who you're gonna be surrounded by. But, but then when you actually get a chance to meet those people, it's just, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing, uh, just, they're, they're just human beings just like us. And, and, and they, they live and they love just like we do here in the state. So, uh, man, that, that's amazing story. Yeah, each of them had, each of them was able to within that tribe, within in the midst of that jungle, each of them were able to, to establish a, a life, establish a family where they cared for one another. Each of them were very important to one another, and that's the thing that I took away from my experience of living with the mountain yards for a year was how precious and how important each one of them were to one another. They depended upon one another, and that's a that's a tremendous lesson to be able to carry through. The rest of your life with it, is realizing how precious each of us are to one another. Absolutely, and and um. So at the time you were twenty three years old, so right. you were, you were really young yourself, and yeah. so um you you were you kind of were able to administer aid to to some other folks uh, during this battle. Um, how did you have the mental strength to carry on uh, after being like shot a, a multiple times? Well, I think initially. Um, training has a lot to do with, with the, your, your, um, your actions in combat when things happen. You know, um, you know, something happens, but instead of fear, fear kicking in, your training kicks in. The, the, the greatest combat to fear for me was my training. Uh, it, it enabled me to, okay, no matter what I'm experiencing, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I, I know I have the skills to do it. And so I was able to uh, do what I was trained to do, do what everybody expected me to do, do what people depended upon me to be able to do in order to be a part of that tribe, to be a part of that special forces team. Each of us had our responsibility. So training was such an important, important thing. But the other thing is I thought about it over the years, the other thing that really com combated that fear was during that experience, I. I experienced something else that was even greater than the fear. Um, after being shot the third time, I don't know how much of my action was based on courage. <laughs> you know, I don't know where, where and how courage played a part, but I, I found something that was even stronger than courage. And I think it came from Dale. When we were both wounded and both of us were dragging each other, both of us thought that the other one might die. We looked at each other and there was something that was exchanged between the two of us that was greater than any fear of dying. 
and there was a love that was there. Um, I often say that, that my courage failed, but faith was born. I had a faith that there was something greater than myself, something greater to believe in, something that was more important in life than just me. And that was loving someone else more than yourself. There was that love that was shared between Dale and, and me that enabled us to continue to do what we did and that eventually enabled Dale to roll me over and lay on top of me to protect me. It was that love. Uh, that's where the strength came from. Now I just say that courage is, is just love in action. Absolutely, man. I get, I get goosebumps just listening to your story. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And Sergeant Major Luttrell, you were also in Kontum province the first week of April 1970. You were an advisor to the Vietnamese Army and were awarded the Medal of Honor for action that occurred over four days from April 4 to April 8. Over those four days, you were subject to a prolonged attack. You led the effort to beat the enemy, risking your life to do so. What can you share with our viewers about those harrowing days? Well, like, uh, like Gary, let me, uh, let me start uh, before Vietnam uh, and lead up to the Vietnam, uh, my experience in Vietnam. 1965, um, I was with the 82nd Airborne Division and we went to the Dominican Republic and that was considered a combat tour. I got my combat uh, infantryman's badge and my combat patch. And then I uh, was an instructor from there. I went to as an instructor in ranger school. In 1968, most of the fellow instructors had been to Vietnam, and I had not um, because of that so-called combat tour down in uh, the Dominican Republic. So in 68, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I didn't want to be the only instructor on the team that had not been. And I was selected to go to language school, which definitely affected me. And so I went to El Paso, Texas to uh, Vietnamese language school for one year. And then in 69 was uh, deployed to Vietnam as an advisor to the Vietnamese Rangers. But my Ranger experience in the States really uh, benefited me. The group commander when I got there, Colonel Tom, uh, had been one of my previous students. We had 23 officers, uh, Viet uh, Vietnamese officers come through Army Ranger School. When I got there, he, he remembered me. Then when I spoke to him in his own language, uh, the bond uh, was there. And he had the utmost uh, respect uh, in me and uh, knew of my capability. So April the 1st, the day that Gary's battle started, we got an operations order that said a special forces base camp is being overrun up in Doxiang. And um, we need you uh, to take your Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, which consisted of 473 Vietnamese Rangers and four Americans, um, move in, penetrate uh, the special forces camp, set up a perimeter and evacuate the dead and wounded. And so that we got that order on the first, and we uh, we were deployed then on the fourth. We moved to one hilltop uh, away from Doxiang, a special force base camp area, and darkness caught us. And uh, the only people that moved uh, in the night was, uh, and so we decided to spend the night on the hill, and then make the push into the uh, base camp following morning. When we got up on the hill, uh, again, I had uh, 473 Vietnamese Rangers, the best soldiers that I've ever seen. And we had four Americans. I had two brand new lieutenants. Um, they were they were so new in country, they were still peeing stateside water. And I had a young, uh, a young Sergeant E-5. And um, I was 24 years old and they referred to me as the old man. Uh, I was fortunate enough to make E7 when I was 24 years old. Um, and so I'm the old man. I'd been in country for eight months. The three of them had only been in country 
few weeks. So we got up on the hill. They sort of looked to me for advice, even though, you know, an E7, uh, those two lieutenants theoretically outranked me. But with eight months in country uh, and being the elder, they looked to me. So I, I, uh, I got, we got up on top of the hill and I said, you know, I don't feel comfortable. That sixth sense kicks in. You know, something is not right. I don't hear the birds. I don't hear the monkeys. That means there's people out there. So I turned to the two lieutenants and, uh, and the young sergeant, and I said, guys, we need to dig in tonight. We need to dig us a foxhole. Our minimum, you know, a fighting position would be smaller than a foxhole. And they looked at me and looked at each other and said, will you listen to the old man? He expects us to dig a foxhole in these rocks. And I said, guys, we need to dig in. I said, you do what you want to. And I turned to my two cowboys um, as an American advisor, you're, you're issued two soldiers who get me soldiers. One is a bodyguard, one is a comfort person. You know, they, they hung my hammock, uh, cooked my meals, uh, forged um, bamboo sprouts and all as we moved through the jungle because the only thing we took was rice. And I looked at my two cowboys and I said, guys, you dig a box hole big enough for the three of us. I'm going to take some C4 and I'm going to fall over the side of the hill and, um, and blow us a landing zone. And so I just finished blowing a landing zone because we, as Gary said, we were in the, we were in the jungle. And, um, and so we couldn't get a helicopter in, into the jungle. So I blew a, I blew a spot big enough that he could hover and, and, and land. And I just finished and I heard an old familiar sound. It was a, a hollow sound of thump, thump, thump. And I said, oh, that don't sound good. Now that sounds like 60 millimeter mortar rounds. And then I heard three more, three more, and three more. And I said, okay, I don't have much time. I hope Yai and two, my two uh, cowboys have got a, a foxhole dug because we're going to need it. And I started running as fast as I could uh, to the top of the hill. And when I got there, sure enough, they had dug us, uh, the three of us, a foxhole but the battalion commander and lieutenant green and the battalion commander's rto was in that foxhole and i um i, I hate to admit i probably used the lord's name in vain i was pretty <laughs> upset and um especially at the at lieutenant green which i said guys we need to dig in but uh, i seen a tree that had fallen and it was a big tree and i said okay I don't have, I've, I've got seconds. I'm going to go face first and other body parts first into this tree. Uh, so if I get shrapnel, I'm going to be like uh, Forrest Gump. You know, it's going to be in my buttocks. And, um, and so I, I hugged that tree and started counting. And I, I counted to 12. And then I got that burnt egg smell. And if you're close enough to a mortar round, that you can smell that burnt egg, that mortar round is in your hip pocket. And I said, well, I don't feel any shrapnel. I don't feel like I'm hurt. Uh, but that one, boy, it really come close. So I rolled over, went over to the foxhole. I was going to have a serious talk with the battalion commander and Lieutenant Green and looked in the foxhole and one of the 12 rounds had gone in that fox. Kill the battalion commander, kill Lieutenant Green, fill Lieutenant Humphrey's uh, uh, vital organs. He had a lot of damage to his liver, full of shrapnel. Busted Sergeant Dykes' uh, eardrums. He was bleeding from the ears and the, the nose and the eyes. And um, so I got on the radio. I said, I need a medevac in here as quick as possible uh, to get them out. And so I got one bird in. I said, and by the way, en route, I said, bring as much ammunition as you can. Kick it out on the LZ. I'll load the, I'll load the, the battalion commander, Lieutenant Green, Lieutenant Humphreys, and Sergeant Bikes, and you guys get out of here. And so they did. 
And I called in to Colonel Som, who was our group commander, the one that I'd put through Ranger School. I told him, I said, um, you know, the battalion commander's dead. ANXO um, had a mental breakdown. Uh, I, I'm surprised because the Vietnamese Rangers were tough. But he was a political appointee. And uh, so I can see that. And so I told Colonel Sama, the battalion commander's dead. I said, the battalion XO is, uh, he said, okay, you're the commander. He said, shoot the executive officer and, and take command of the battalion. And I said, no, 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 sir, I'm not going to shoot the executive order. In, in uh, the Vietnamese army, the battalion commander has execution authority. Um, and in a situation like that, the battalion commander probably would, but me being appointed battalion commander, there's no way I'm going to shoot the XO. So we just put him in a foxhole with his cowboys and told him to watch him. And then we went into a nonstop four day, four night battle. And, uh, you know, people say, well, did you lay down and sleep during that time? And I, my answer to that is, I don't remember ever saying, I'm going to lay down and sleep because it was pretty much nonstop. Um, we had 12 in between, uh, in between you know, massive waves of body trying to take that hill. Uh, in between that, I had to have taken it because I think it's virtually impossible to stay awake four days before night. And so some of the, the most interesting things, uh, you know, we had a uh, C-130 because every time the, every time the, um, well, the C-130 was dropping fire at night to kind of keep our battle, uh, battle zone lit up. And as long as he was uh, dropping flares, uh, the enemy wouldn't attack the hill. As soon as that, those flares went out, we would get just a massive wave. Um, Gary and I have uh, have gone over the figures that the Vietnamese uh, said was out there. Uh, my Vietnamese battalion says we were fighting the 66th NVA Regiment, the 29th NVA Regiment, and the K6 Sapper Battalion, which consisted of about 5,000 wow. of the North Vietnamese best. Gary's, uh, Gary's statistics said that uh, they attacked... Um, his special forces base camp with approximately 10,000. So somewhere, um, somewhere between five and 10,000 enemy, um, what made our attack. It was real easy to do because Doxiang province is right in the tri-country uh, area, Cambodia, Laos, um, and Vietnam, right in that tri-country area. It was a big ridge line that, sh that separated Vietnam from Cambodia and Laos, ridge line 1043, huge mountain range. On the other side of that um, was the uh, um, Ho Chi Minh Trail. I know you've, you've read about Vietnam. The, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was, was like a two lane highway. I mean, they, we couldn't go over there because it was Cambodia and Laos. They could run through. And then they dug. Um, tunnels through Ridgeline 1043, and that's how they come down. So it was it was a massive attack. As soon as those flares would go out, uh, you know, we had a, uh, we'd have a human wave just coming at us again. And so the C-130 pilot said, uh, you know, 3-3 Charlie, which is my call sign, said, you've got to get, uh, you got to get out in a, in a little clearing and uh, turn your strobe light on because without that strobe light, we, we you know, we, we lose your location. So I'd find a little semi-clear area and I'd shine that strobe light. And every time I turn that strobe light on about 500 people tried to put that strobe light out and uh, got my antenna shot off my radio, got the hand, uh, the handset uh, cord uh, shot off, uh, Trapping on the back of the, the radio in my canteen, uh, you know. So finally, I I told a C-130 pilot, I said, "Look, I, I'm not standing up on top of this hill playing Statue of Liberty no more." So every time I turn this light on, somebody tries to put it out. And so you know, you learn something every day, and I learned a valuable, valuable. Um, 
that day. I had a Vietnamese private come over to me and he said, Tung Shin Nut Luttrell, uh, you take this N79, you put that strobe light in the breech of that M79, which it fit perfectly. Then you point the M79 rocket launcher at the airplane. The airplane can see the strobe light, but no one else can. And I said, isn't this something? I, I, here I am, an instructor in ranger school, thought I knew everything about everything. And here's a little Vietnamese private showing me how to stay alive. And so um, that was one interesting part of that four days and four nights. Um, I just, um, the Italian surgeon and I just continued to move from position to position, um, treating the wounded, uh, redistributing ammunition, and at the end of the fourth night, we was completely broken off. Nothing left. Wow. And I said, well, this is it. Okay, the party's over. Next wave that comes by, uh, they, they will overrun the hill and, and they will kill what's left. And we waited and waited and it didn't come. So what we figured later is hopefully we had beat them down. I had so much air support, so much artillery support that um, we had probably beaten them down to where they were out of ammunition and they were, their numbers were pretty small also. So the, the morning of day five, we got the order to withdraw and I got a head count and out of the 473 Vietnamese, I had 41 walking wounded left. And out of the Americans, the four of us, I was the only one. And most everyone was wounded. The only two people that were not wounded, dead or wounded, was the battalion surgeon and myself. And we looked at each other after the battle and said, well, the reason we wasn't wounded is we didn't stay in, in one place long enough to get wounded. He and I was out on, on the field, I mean, on that hill. Uh, getting our job done. When we got um, when we got ready to uh, withdraw, I said, you know, I need some. Uh, we're out of ammunition, and I'm afraid we're going to run through some ambushes uh, from what's left of the uh, of the enemy. They they probably know we're going to withdraw. They know where our headquarters. They know our our, our route, and most likely they're going to set up some ambushes, which they did. And uh, again, we were completely out of ammunition. So I said, I'm gonna need some, uh, I'm gonna need some air support um, to come off this hill. I said, we're out of ammunition. So when we get an ambush, we need to back off and you guys roll those fast movers or those helicopter gunships in there and air the enemy for me. And the word come back uh, from the group commander, well, 3-3 three, three, Charlie, I'm sorry, but you're number three in priority. Uh, which didn't sit real good with me. And he said, but I understand it. I, I totally understand it. He said, you're not in heavy contact. I have other units that are in heavy contact. They are priority one and two. You're priority number three. And I said, well, this don't look good, but uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, uh, to get it, you know, the 41 walking wounded off, off this hill. And fortunate for me, I had a forward air controller come up on my push and he said, three, three, Charlie, well, this is Zulu two, four. I said, you know, we've been supporting you for four days and four nights and we're not going to stop supporting you. If we get a, a deferred mission, we will roll in. You we know your third priority, but we have a mission. And if that mission gets canceled or gets deferred and we'll roll in, help you. And then I had a helicopter gunship. Uh, Warren officer, uh, but and I become good friend. I'm a Warren officer, tech. I'm a, he said, uh, "Thirty three, Charlie. I, you know, I've been working for you with eight months. Uh, I'm not going to abandon you again. We get a diverted mission, we'll roll in. And when we would hit an ambush, and we would back off, and I said, anybody in the sky that can help, um, we'll pop smoke and uh, fifty uh, uh, fifty yards in front of that smoke." I got to have everything you got and 50 yards uh, from some 500 pound bombs. Uh, that's danger close. I remember dropping one napalm and uh, 
50 yards out and it just sucked all the oxygen out of the air. And it's like, wow. But we made it off the hill. Uh, I brought 41. Uh, up. We may have lost a few more once I got down to the hospital. I, I don't have that count. But I'm proud to say that through my training, um, I was able to get 41 human lives. Very, very and then... Um, had no idea that my 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 Conrad here, Gary Biker, was was in that base camp, and no idea whatsoever. So three and a half years later, he and I was summoned to the White House, uh, and President Nixon was going to award us the Medal of Honor. And so there was a group of nine of us that hadn't been awarded President Nixon in quite some time because it was an unpopular war. But Nixon, um, our, our award ceremony was in between Watergate and goodbye. And so he wanted to clear the books before he resigned. And so he had nine of us there. And we're standing there and uh, they start to read a citation. And they say, in Pontoon Province in April of 1970, boy, I snapped to attention. I said, that's me. And he says, the Medal of Honor is presented to Gary Biker. And I said, what? <laughs> Here we are in the White House and these jokers can't even get my name right. I'm Gary Luttrell. I'm not <laughs> Gary Biker. <laughs> and then they start, he started reading the citation and then that little bell ding. I said, oh my God, that's the guy that was in the story report that I was attempting to get in. And, uh, so from that day until this, uh, he is my brother, much, much closer to me than my, my and, uh, he and his wife and me and my wife, the four of us are the very, very close to him. And but earlier, we've got some challenges ahead of us physically, but we're going to beat these, uh, we're going to beat these challenges. And we're gonna have many, many more years. Wow, that's amazing story. Amazing story. Um, and and you, you mentioned that you were 24 years old uh, during all this uh, earlier in, in your story. And you know, just again, you know, we we put so much on on young men and young men, women uh, who wear this uniform at such an early age in their life. Um, like so. So I know for for Sergeant Biker, he he said the training and love was kind of what what kind of put him in a position to succeed. And so I'm just curious to know, you know, what how did you find the courage in the in the mental fortitude to to kind of get through those four days? Well, I, I agree with uh, with Gary. Uh, training, there is it is it is impossible for a human being to stay awake for four days and four. You cannot. And so without the training, without going through United States Army Ranger School, without going back as an instructor and train and train and train, when the, when the mind got to where it couldn't function properly, training had to kick in. And I continue to function from the training I had. So no saying, training is everything and everything is training. You train to the max Army Ranger School will take you as close to death as it can without actually killing you. Yeah. And that makes you strong. I was prepared. And of course, I've been in the country for a month and I'd already received three bronze stars um, and a few other things. So at the age of 24, I've been in the military five years. That five years was hard training and then eight months of pretty tough combat. So I was mentally, physically prepared for the four days before. Gotcha. You know, that's, that's just amazing because we continue even today, training is key. Uh, from basic training all the way through, you know, somebody can still be in the Army for 20 or any, any branch of the military for 20 plus years. Uh, and still training is the key to, to success. So, you know, I, I really appreciate you telling us about that. 
Now, Sergeant Major Luttrell, you started to talk about uh, the ceremony at the White House, but each of you received the Medal of Honor on that day on October 15th, 1973 from President Nixon. Can you share a little more, uh, each of you, about what you remember from that day? I'm going to go, Gary? <laughs> yes, please, Gary. Okay, yeah. Well, for me, me I kind of had a unique experience. I, when I came home from the war, uh, I tried to go back to college, and uh, unfortunately, the anti-war sentiment was pretty, pretty heavy back then, and uh, I had some bad experiences. I was still trying to deal with a lot of uh, uh, things that happened in Vietnam, the death of Dale, why him, why, why was I not killed? Uh, but then receiving the treatment that many of us Vietnam veterans got from, the, from our own home, uh, that hurt more than anything that happened in the military. So I decided that what I needed to do was to try to forget about Vietnam. Uh, for me, if I could just forget about it, I'd be getting better. And one of the things that I chose to do to try to forget about it was I went, decided to go up into northern New Hampshire, and I found a nice little cave in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And I, I lived in the cave for 18 months, trying to forget about the war. I was only in the cave for two weeks when I was notified that I was being awarded the Medal of Honor. Now here I am trying to forget about something and now they're gonna give me a medal for something that I'm trying to forget about. And it, it just didn't set right. Um, reluctantly, I decided to go down because special forces meant a lot to me. And so I went to Washington. Um, much of that is a blur. You have to remember two days earlier, I was in a cave in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Now I'm in front of the president of the United States and he's putting this medal around my neck. Uh, I don't remember much because one of the things that I needed to do in order to try to forget was I shut down everything. My, my belief was that if I just didn't care about anything, then I wouldn't feel anything and I wouldn't be bothered by any of those feelings that I'm trying to forget. So I shut down totally. I didn't care about anything. But now I found myself in the White House and uh, looking back on it, I think one of the things that I most felt at that time was just totally out of place. You know, it's like I showed up at a formal in uh, ripped jeans and a sweatshirt, you know, like, what am I doing here? You know, this, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I listened to the stories of all the men that were, their citations were read and I'm, and I'm thinking, man, these guys are just, you know, what am I doing here among these men? And, uh, I just didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable with the medal. I didn't feel comfortable with trying to remember Vietnam again. So they had like a, a few days of celebrations planned. But after the, after the ceremony, the next day we went to the Pentagon. And then after that ceremony, I told my escorts, I said, I, I can't be here. I gotta, you gotta send me home. And so I left after the second day. And I went back, went back to the cave and I put the medal in my duffel bag and I, I never took it out again for seven years because I just didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't know what it meant. And for, I think for all of us that wear this medal, that's a battle that we all have to fight. We all have to come to, come to an answer of why me? You know, what did I do that was so different? I only did what I was trained to do. And that's a tough battle to fight. Um, most of us are doing things because we care for something else more than ourselves, We're not doing it for any kind of glory or any kind of recognition to ourselves, for ourselves. We do it because we love something, someone better than us. And then to find out afterwards that now you're being recognized, now you're being singled out for something that was selfless. And, and that's a hard thing to reconcile. And I just had a real tough time reconciling that. So I stayed in the cave for another another year trying to understand all that and trying to come to some sense of what the war meant, what the medal meant. But as far as the ceremony in DC, it's, it's just a, it's a blur. I don't really remember too much at all. Gary, if you don't mind me asking uh, you, would, would, would you uh, share your experience uh, how you met Lolly and what mm -hmm. she now means to you and I know how she, she means to you just like Susie means to me. There's nothing else in this world but, but our, our ladies. So please share, uh, please share with the group that story. Yeah, when my, 
when people hear my story and it's time for questions and answers, they don't want to know much about the battle. They want to, don't know one about the Medal of Honor. They want to know, wow, when you lived in a cave for a year and a half, what was that like? You know, they don't, they don't care about the Battle of Vietnam or the Medal of Honor. They want to know about living in a cave. And like I said, I went into the cave to try to forget, believing that if I could forget, I would get better. But there were th two things that happened when I was in that cave that changed my life. One was I, I had a post office box down in Lancaster, New Hampshire. And I went there and that's where I got the note that told me that I was gonna be awarded the Medal of Honor. The other thing that changed my life was I went down in there another day after I'd come back from receiving the Medal of Honor, still believing that if I could just forget and stay away from everybody, I'd get better. But I found this note and I opened it up and said, hi, my name's Lolly. I've seen you around town. I mean, and I had hair down to here and I drove a candy apple red van and Lancaster only had about 2000 people in the whole town. And so she just started sending me these notes two or three times a week. And um, then she put a picture in there. And I looked at that picture and I said, wow, she's pretty, pretty cute. And I decided right then that I was gonna find this girl whether I had to knock on every door in Lancaster or not, because <laughs> she was gorgeous. <laughs> well, I, I, met her, I, I met her in the laundromat. I saw her in the laundromat. We met, we talked, we, uh, we had one date. And I said, um, so when are we gonna get married? And she said, well, I'll marry you. You gotta come out of the cave. <laughs> <You know? So laughs> I, 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 I say that Lolly taught me that forgetting isn't getting better. Getting better is finding someone who's willing to come into your cave. And we all, we all have caves that we retreat to when we wanna heal, when we wanna feel better. But getting better is finding someone who can come into that cave with you and who will love you and who will be there for you, support you, will listen. And no matter what they find in that cave with you, they will never ever leave you. And that's what Lolly has been to me. She's, and she's been with me for 45 years. And she has been my battle buddy. She has been the reason that I came out of the cave. But uh, there were two things. Um, and, she, and she's much younger than me. She's about 10 years younger than me. So um, actually, when, she, I was, when I was in Vietnam, she was in the brownies. You know, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> she's been a real battle buddy for 45 years, as Susie has with Gary. Man, that's wow. That's an awesome story. Well, my experience uh, coming back from Vietnam was totally different than Gary's and a lot of my uh, uh, Vietnam uh, buddies. Um, they had some, some of them had some very, very bad experiences returning home and welcomed as we arrived in the airport. Um, as uh, Gary didn't say, but he shared with me before, you know, he tried to go to college. He couldn't because people knew he was a Vietnam veteran. Mine was totally, totally different. I come back, I stayed on active duty. I didn't get met in the airport by an angry mob. It had one little sarcastic cousin uh, at a family reunion. And after I smacked his head down the bowl of mashed potatoes, he shut up. <laughs> but um, uh, my experiences were totally, totally different. I stayed on active duty, I lived on base. I went about training soldiers for the next battle, uh, never looked back. Uh, so to, to me, Vietnam was just you know, that history. Let's look forward. Um, and so when you have, uh, now you're a senior NCO and you're training, you're training and training and training, you know, getting ready for the next battle. And then when I was a first sergeant in Charlie Company, first 75th, I mean, that training was there intense. And so I never looked back. And then three and a half years uh, uh, later, I get uh, notified that I'm going to receive the Medal of Honor. I said, why? You know, why? When I left Vietnam, we had a going away party and my colonel put his arm around me. We'd both been sipping on the juice a little bit and a little, little bit of truth serum. And uh, he put his arm around me. He said, you know, I'm thinking about putting you in for the Medal of Honor for that action you got in on top of the wall. Oh, I said, okay. And then I went on about training. So, so three and a half years later, you know, the Medal of Honor had never crossed my mind. And so we went up, uh, 
D.C. altogether different than Gary Berrien. Uh, the White House ceremony was very, very quick. There was nine of us, and Nixon probably spent no more than 15 minutes, uh, not like the Medal of Honor ceremonies today. He put the medal around my neck, muttered something, and moved on. But we spent the rest of the day in the White House. Uh, the press secretary, uh, Ziegler, um, took us all through the White House except the uh, living quarters. And then, as Gary said, we went to the Pentagon the next day. And then we had partied and sight the, uh, for the next five days. Had a captain and an E-7 uh, escort. We went to all of the uh, uh, museums and everything. I mean, just... It was just a great experience. Then I come home and I and as I, I took the medal off. I put it in pop dresser drawer. I tried not to let the word Medal of Honor cross my lips. And I went back. I'd have wore the medal and, and bragged about the medal. I could not have done my job properly. So I took it off, put it in the pop dresser drawer and went about my job. But when I retired, I realized that me wearing this medal and going out and talking to groups of people, it's not me, it's for them. I remember Master Sergeant Morris come to the 101st Airborne Division. He was a Medal of Honor recipient. And I said, oh my God, I want to meet a Medal of Honor recipient. So I went out in this big line over to the library and I got within about five people and they put him in a car and off he went. I was so disappointed. And I said, you know, I cannot deprive, especially young soldiers, the opportunity to see a Medal of Honor and to shake hands with a Medal of Honor. And so now, took it out of the top dresser drawer, as Gary did, took it out of his duffel bag, we put the medal on, and we get in front of as many people as we can, especially students. And we talk about the six values of the Medal of Honor. Courage, sacrifice, integrity, which is the most important word in the language, citizenship, and peer. And we love what we're doing. We wish we could do it in person instead of virtual, but we're still getting to the children uh, virtually. And so it's been a wonderful life. Awesome. Awesome. We definitely appreciate that. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, both of you. Um, Want to just continue kind of on this, this path. Sergeant Major Luttrell, you retired from the Army, and Sergeant Bykirk, you became a pastor, is what we understand. Both of you exemplify a life of service. Can you each share why service before self is a virtue that's it's vital to our nation? Gary, please go ahead. I, yeah, I did try the, try the position of being a pastor for a short time, but it, it wasn't too long before I realized that I was not called to be a pastor. Um, I found out that people kind of act, acted differently towards me once they found out that, uh, that there was a reverend associated with my name. So I, I quit being a pastor, but I loved working with the kids. So I went back to graduate school and I became a, uh, got a degree in counseling and I from pastoring, I, I worked as a middle school counselor for 33 years, working with middle school kids. And mainly for the reason that I wanted to try to instill in them the same values that Deo taught me. Here was a 15 year old, and if he could believe in something so strongly that he'd be willing to give his life for it, other young people also had that potential to care so deeply about something, to be committed to something, to be willing to sacrifice I believe that every young person had that, had that ability. And in Vietnam, we had a saying that to really live, you must almost die. To really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life has a meaning to protect it, we'll never know. Deo, Deo taught me that, that to really live meant maybe dying to yourself. It doesn't mean having to die physically, but just to deny yourself, to really live, deny yourself, die yourself, and find out what it's like to live for something more than you. If you can do that, life will have a meaning to protect it, we'll never know. Life will become something special to you when you realize that others are important, 
that each person is unique and precious and you'll understand what it means to make a difference in the life of someone else. That's what a life of service is. It's, it's a life of service can become a life of significance if you make a difference in the lives of others. And I really believe that to really live, you must almost die, not die physically, but die to yourself. And so that's the message that, that we try to communicate to young people and why service is such an important part of living a life of significance. Gary, you, 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 you know, there's no way I can top that. I, you know, I can't even come close. Okay. Mm -hmm. He has said it. He, he wrapped it all up in one big Christmas present. Didn't he guys? Mm -hmm. but, uh, for, sure. you know, for me, um, I get pleasure out of giving. And when I was on active duty, my giving was training my soldiers. That was my giving. And then I was fortunate enough, uh, after I retired, to have a second career with the Veterans Administration. And when I retired uh, from the Veterans Administration, I was a patient advocate at a Tampa VA hospital, where if the patients in that hospital had an issue, I was the go-to guy. I was the guy that made that problem go away. And I, I found out through life that you get so much more out of giving than you do taking. Uh, so taking is for selfish people. Giving is what I enjoy, what Gary enjoys. It's so much more rewarding. Yeah, no, I, I posted something on my, my social media um, and it, and it kind of went like, Take takers eat good, but 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 givers sleep good, yeah. and, and and so uh, I, I like, much, that. I, I I much, like that. I much I much rather sleep well than than eat well. If that if that makes sense. So I'm I'm gonna have to steal that from you, Chief. It's all it's all yours, I'll sir. Borrow it from you, not steal it from you. I borrow it from you. <laughs> you can have it. I, I, I really it. like that. Yeah, I, I stole it from someone else. So you you by all means you can use it. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, we'd love to know what you're, what you're doing nowadays, uh, each each one of you. Um, what, what's 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 going on? Uh, I know COVID has kind of put a, put a damper on uh, you know you going getting out to the kids, uh, but you know just individually. I know you you're probably uh, retired and, and and loving life in Florida and uh, in upstate New York. Well, both of us have been very active with the Medal of Honor Society um, since we retired. And again, it's now it's really a pleasure to work with the society because we've got a lot of new uh, recipients from Afghanistan and Iraq. It goes back now, uh, believe it or not, we back in the training program. Mm -hmm. You know, we train the young recipients how to wear that medal, and for them to know when they put that medal around their neck. Now they're expected to set the example. They make mistakes because now they're a Medal of Honor recipient. Um, from that, I started my own foundation um, two years ago called Tribute to Valor. If you want to, uh, if you want to visit tributetovalor.org, and my mission is to get in front of as many students as possible to talk about the six values of the medal, courage, commitment, sacrifice, and integrity. Um, last year, um, Gary uh, and two other of the Medal of Honor recipients collectively talked to over 50,000, excuse me. Um, talked to over 50,000 students. We talked to 5,000 one day in Colleen, Texas, 5,000 the next day in Colleen, Texas. Uh, our goal was to reach 100,000 this year, but because of COVID, um, that didn't happen. We have reached students virtually and probably 20,000. And thanks to COVID, but the vaccination looks like uh, looming. Um, we can set our goals to reach 100,000 kids. 
Awesome. Yeah, and wow. I, I've, I've tried to have some plans, uh, but they never seem to work out. Uh, and so I, I, I've developed kind of like a, you know, living and walking by faith. I mean, after I retired, I, I had this dream of, of going and traveling with the society and, and doing things with the character development program and tribute to valor. But shortly after I retired, I was diagnosed with uh, stage three colon cancer. So for three years, I, I, I battled that. Um, now I was uh, feeling a little bit better and, and my wife and I were starting to get out a little bit and uh, planning and uh, 2020 hit us with COVID, but not only COVID, but just recently I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So, you know, it's, um, you sometimes wonder, you know, I, I got these plans, but God, am I hearing you right? You know, I, uh, when, when I was going through colon cancer, our, our daughter came by one day and she said, you know, how do you guys do it? How do you face all the challenges that you go through? Um, and my wife said to her, well, you know, Stephanie, I think we've learned that you look for God moments. You look for those moments when you know that you're not alone, that you know that uh, there's somebody with you who cares uh, and that God has a plan for what you're doing and he's not gonna leave you alone. So in the midst of colon cancer, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of this pancreatic cancer, um, we're just walking by faith. You know, we, we, uh, we believe we have a purpose and the purpose is to uh, share with others what God has taught us about life, about him, about loving one another. And we're just trusting in him. So, uh, and we're looking for those God moments, those moments, like even yesterday when I was in the hospital going for a biopsy, uh, we had a chance to, uh, to share. My wife had a chance to share with a, a young family that was in the waiting room um, because they were very, very sick. And she had a chance to just share with them, to let them know that they were not alone. You know, in life, pain is inevitable. We're all gonna suffer pain. Pain is something we're gonna experience in life, but suffering is optional. We all don't have to suffer. Pain does not have to become suffering. See, pain becomes suffering when we realize, when we feel that there's no hope, that we, when we think that there's no one who cares, that there's no one with us, sharing and allowing ourselves to become part of someone else that prevents pain from becoming suffering because we're able to share with others. We are able to realize that, hey, I'm not alone. And because of that, there's always a source of hope. So that's, that's what Lolly and I have been doing uh, in the midst of uh, COVID, in the midst of pancreatic cancer, uh, just real, helping people realize that, hey, it's, it's difficult what we're going through, but we're not alone. Absolutely. And you both of y'all have such a wonderful outlook on life in general. And so uh, thank you for sharing that with our, with our viewers. And also uh, we're, we're praying for you. Uh, sorry, Mike, Kirk, uh, as you as you deal with, um, you know, cancer and, and, and getting over that. So we, we definitely you got a bunch of prayers coming from Dallas, Texas and Germany uh, on this call and, and all over the world. So I know Aliyah's got some uh, some comments uh, that she's going to go over here in a second. Yes, sir. The great reminder. Thanks for sharing that with us. Want to just take a second and pause to read and look at the live feed. People are tuning in from all over the world, um, literally all over the world. Want to share a few comments. So Sergeant Major Jermaine Crudup, he is tuning in from Okinawa. He said early in the chat, incredible story. Thank you for sharing. Tony says, that's a lot of coins behind you. How many do you have and which is your favorite? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, yeah, there's quite a few there. Oh yeah, wow. I don't know that I can say I have a favorite. Um, How could you choose just one? <laughs> can you? So I'm gonna go out on the limb and say my favorite is my, my brother Gary Biker going. Awesome. Oh. That's very sweet. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to add one coin to that that collection, though. So just uh, we'll, we'll get some we'll get some information <laughs> after the chat. People were so also. How many loving... do I have? Um, oh my goodness! Um, I've got a drawer full that I don't have room to display. 
So I'm going to round it. I don't oh know. I, let's just say 500. <laughs> wow. Impressive. Impressive. People were loving when you guys were talking about your, your wives um, and saying beautiful love story, things like that. Uh, people were saying they were tearing up just hearing your love story. Steve says, thank you for your service, heroes. And lots of people saying thank you. This comment, I think it really, um, it, it's gonna, you guys are gonna like that. Kevin Williams said, I met Gary Bykirk several years ago here in Lancaster, California at the Lancaster Baptist Church. He's a testament to the grace of God and a real person. He's a humble man who lives for others. So humble has been a word that's been shared in the comments quite often about you guys. Thank you, Kevin. Chief, did you, did I miss some? Did, did you guys see something that else? No, no I, everybody loves Gary and Gary. So <laughs> like I said, <laughs> you guys are, are like, yeah. A great law firm. That's a good name for a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, Gary. Well, I've got enough experience with the law to. Uh, <laughs> that's but that's another story. <laughs> what, what I'll tell you both is, you know, my father and my wife's father are both Vietnam veterans. So we wish that uh, you guys were welcomed home properly. And I want to say to both of you, welcome home. And also thank you to your generation for ensuring that our generation did not get welcomed home that way. Uh, we know that it's uh, it's gentlemen like you that are uh, the root for that. So welcome home to both of you. And, you know, we wanted to give you both a chance to say some parting words for our viewers, uh, you know, as we say goodbye. Uh, what would both you like to share with us? You know, let me, uh, let me say to all of those that are watching and are listening, Live your life with character. Without character, we're an empty body without it. Courage. Have the courage to do the right thing under. Anyone can, can be courageous when times are good. Have the courage to stand up, be committed. Once you take a, a challenge, you are committed. Take that commitment. Integrity is the most important word in the human When I talk to the children, I ask them, look in the mirror, ask yourself, who am I? Am I a person of integrity? How do I want to be perceived by the person to my right and left? How do I want to be perceived by my teachers and my parents? But most of all, when I look in that mirror, how do I want to be perceived? Am I a liar? Am I a cheat? Am I a thief? Integrity, integrity. Start building your integrity as early in life as you can because your integrity defines you. Look in the mirror, ask yourself, who am I and what do I need to improve on? Today? Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you, Sergeant Luttrell. Sergeant Biker. I, I jokingly say that I, the reason that I came out of the cave was because my wife wouldn't come into the cave. But in actuality, I came out of the cave because I believed that after a year and a half, there was a message being formed in my heart, a message that, that I needed to be shared. When I went into the cave, I was trying to reflect on what did Vietnam mean? What did the war teach me? And what did this Medal of Honor mean? And I, I came out of that cave with a message believing that about the Medal of Honor, that the Medal of Honor, I finally realized it was, it's not about anything that I've done. Actually, the Medal of Honor is not really about any one person 
who did any one thing on any one day, the honor that comes from this medal is that it's, it's greater than one. The honor, we wear something that is much greater than one person who did one thing on any one day. It represents millions of men and women who have loved this country and who have sacrificed and who have served. This medal represents all of those who put on a uniform and are willing to go anywhere at any time, regardless of the cost. That's the honor that comes with this medal. And it's an honor to be able to wear it. I realized that when I, when I wear it, when I put it around my neck, there's not any room for self. I don't wear it for myself. I wear it for every man and woman who served. And then for me too, I also realized that the honor that comes with this medal is that it says a message that we like to share with young people as Gary was talking about. And that message is that there's a different way to live your life. Believing that there's something greater than yourself, believing in loving others, caring about others more than yourself. That's the honor that's inherent in this Medal of Honor. That it shares a message of men and women who believe in living a life differently, living a life for others. And on a more personal note, I realized that when I put this medal on, it's not about me, it's not about anything that I've done, but for me, it's about God. Because when I wear it, I wear it for his honor because it's only because of God's grace that I survived Vietnam. It's only because of God's work in my life that I was able to come out and stay out of that cave because I realized of his love and his forgiveness and his bringing Lolly into my life to be my battle buddy for all those years. So the Medal of Honor means something very, very special to us. It's, it's a battle that each of us have to fight, but it's a battle that I believe each of us has fought and each of us wear this medal carrying the same message of it's not about me, it's about others. And that's what motivates us each time we put on this medal and we go out in front of a group, whether it's a group of servicemen and women or a group of students or a community organization and we share what this medal means, that it's about others and it's about caring for someone more than yourself. And I, like Gary, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to share that message with each of you. But also again, realize that uh, this medal is not about us. We shared our stories, but there are millions of stories that are in, encased and involved with these medals of honor that we wear. Your story is a part of the story that this medal represents. So thank you for your story. Awesome, awesome. So sorry, sorry, Major Latrell and sorry, Biker. Uh, just thank you again. Um, like, like you mentioned before, uh, Vietnam wasn't a, a popular war and you guys probably weren't received at, like, at, as you should have. But, so, but thank you so much for blazing the trail that you have for, for, for people like myself and Colonel McFarland and all the other service members uh, throughout the world uh, to, to follow behind and like you guys are true inspirations to us and we we definitely uh, appreciate just how you represented yourselves and your family and also the, the United States military so thank you so much um, it, it just you're hearing your story of, of courage and resiliency and, and and just your positive outlook on life uh, ha is going to have a lasting impact on all the folks that are looking all our viewers that are tuning in and th this reaches uh, worldwide. So thank you so much for that. We appreciate all that you've done for our great nation. And thank you for, for sharing some time here on Chief Chat. It's definitely a pleasure. Thanks thank for you. inviting us. Yes, thank you very much. All right. Well, yeah. we're, we're going to end the, in the chat. And then uh, if you guys can stay on for a, a quick second, uh, we will, uh, I'll, get, I'll get some information from you. Bye, everybody. All right. Chat out. Chat out.